Hello, in this video I'd like to talk about permutation models. So I'm going to make a few assumptions in this video. First of all, I'm going to assume that you've taken a set theory course before. Uh, this is not going to be an introduction to set theory. Uh, and I'm also going to assume that ZFC is consistent, that the axioms of set theory are consistent. Uh, this is quite a hefty assumption. Uh, we've in fact proven, as mathematicians, that uh, we cannot prove that the axioms of ZFC are consistent. That's something that it will forever be beyond the scope of mathematics. Uh, on the other hand, mathematicians assume this every day, so it's a perfectly fine assumption to make. So I want to do a quick refresher of the axioms of ZF set theory. Uh, first of all, we have extensionality. So we say that two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. That is to say, if we have two sets, A and B, they're going to be equal uh, if, for everything in our set theory, either that thing is in A and in B, or not in A and not in B. So it's not going to be the case that there's something that's in one of them, but not in the other. And this is a really important axiom. We'll come back to it. Uh, we also have the foundation axiom. Uh, what this is meant to do is it's meant to prohibit infinite descending chains of containment. So uh, one set that contains another set, that contains another set, that contains another set, and so on and so forth infinitely. It's mainly devised to um, prevent uh, loops of sets containing themselves or containing a set that contains the original set, uh, things like that. Um, but it also prevents just like an infinite descending chain of containment. Uh, the way that this axiom is worded, it would actually require infinitely many quantifiers to actually prevent there existing a set that contains another set, that contains another set, that contains another set, and so on and so forth. So what this axiom actually does is it prevents there being a set which is the elements of this infinite descending chain. So it's not quite the same, but in spirit, it's preventing there being uh, infinitely deep elements of other sets. And this is kind of interesting. What it means is that every set, in some sense, is only finitely deep, sort of. Uh, everything in that set is only in that set finitely deep. Then we have a bunch of closure axioms, just saying that our set theory is closed under certain operations. For instance, we have the comprehension axiom that says that if we have a particular set uh, and a particular first order logical formula, that we can filter out just those elements of this set that satisfy that particular formula. Uh, and that new filtered set is going to be uh, a set. It's, it's actually going to be a thing as opposed to just some abstract collection. It's going to be a thing in our set theory. And then we have pairing that simply says that we're closed under a pairing operation. We have union, which says that we're closed under capital U union. That is, if we take a set, we can take the union of all of the elements of that set and combine it with pairing, and we can get closure under lowercase u, where we just union two sets together. Uh, we have replacement, which is a little bit spooky in that we're closed under applying uh, functions that are definable in first order logic. And on the surface of it, it's not entirely clear, like if we start off with a set, uh, how wild can applying a first order logic function to that set uh, make the set. Uh, then we have the axiom of infinity, which says that a specific constant called omega exists, uh, which represents using set theoretic numerals uh, the natural numbers. And then we have the power set axiom, which just says that we're closed under the power set operation. If we have a set, we take its power set, that's also going to be a set. So a lot of these are closure axioms, uh, specifying that the structure that set theory forms is going to be closed under these operations. And then sometimes I'm going to want to include this among our axioms and sometimes not. We have the axiom of choice, which says that Given a set of non-empty sets, uh, we can create a function that picks out an element. It takes in as input the set and outputs an element of that set. Uh, and it picks out an element of each of our sets. 
And this is actually something that you need an axiom for, at least in some cases. And we're going to prove in this video that the axiom of choice really is an axiom in that it uh, isn't implied by all of the other axioms. So it's common to think about set theory as a universe that we live in, but I think it's actually going to be more helpful for this talk to think about set theory as a structure, as a mathematical structure, similar to a group, a ring, a field, a linear ordering, or a graph. And just like groups, rings, fields, and linear orderings, uh, these structures have a set of axioms that they have to satisfy, specifically the axioms of set theory. So we have a collection of things which we're going to treat as a set. We're going to have a binary relation on that collection, which we're going to treat as containment. It doesn't have to actually be containment, just as when we're talking about a linear ordering, less than uh, doesn't actually have to be less than, or if we're talking about a ring, addition doesn't have to be addition. Um, in set theory, we could construct a model of set theory uh, that uh, has a completely different notion of containment from what we, living in our universe, uh, think uh, containment is. And that's perfectly fine as long as this structure satisfies these axioms. And what this perspective is going to allow us to do is to construct a set that doesn't have a choice function. So if we were trying to construct a set with a choice function, all we would have to do is construct a set, construct a choice function on that set, uh, and then prove that all of the properties that we needed to be satisfied were satisfied. But if we're trying to construct a set without a choice function, that's saying that nowhere within the universe is there a choice function on that set. And that's going to be a much harder thing to uh, do. It's not something that we can just construct and be done with. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to construct a universe. We're going to construct a model of set theory, a structure uh, with a collection of things that are going to behave like sets and a binary relation that's going to behave like in. Uh, and uh, within this structure, there's going to be an element, a set in that structure uh, that doesn't have a choice function in that structure. And because this structure is going to satisfy the axioms of ZF, but not satisfy the axiom of choice by our construction, it's going to witness the fact that uh, the other axioms do not imply the axiom of choice. So this is, this is quite a hefty thing. We're going to have to create this thing and prove that it satisfies all of the axioms of set theory that it actually is one of these sorts of structures. To make our lives easy, we're going to want a minimal possible counterexample to the axiom of choice, the smallest sort of set that we can't have a choice function on. Uh, any finite set can be shown to have a choice function just manually using the pairing and union axioms. Uh, if you look at those axioms, we're closed under, you know, just picking out elements of a set and then putting them together to form other sets and then maybe putting those things together, uh, just putting together finite sets of finite sets of finite sets. That's something that we're closed under. That's, that's something that we get from the other axioms. Uh, and so we're not going to be able to find a counterexample to the axiom of choice, a set without a choice function, um, from looking at finite sets. So we need an infinite set Let's go with the simplest infinite set that we can think of. Let's go with a countable set. And we're going to want each of these individual choices to be interesting. Of course, if it's a countable set of singletons, eh, you can't make a choice if you have singletons. Um, but you can make a choice if you have pairs. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to produce a countable set of pairs that has no choice function. So set theorists do these sorts of constructions where they create their own set theoretic universes all of the time to study how various properties of set theory are related to each other. Does this property imply this property? Uh, what are the possible, uh, could this be true? Could this be false? What, what are the possible values that a particular number can take? Um, set theorists love talking about lots of different models of set theory. Uh, but the sorts of tools that they use, uh, they're quite hefty. 
So in order to be able to use the tool that we're going to be using in this video, specifically permutation models, we're actually going to have to go to something slightly different, not quite a model of set theory. It's going to be a model of what's called ZFA, ZF set theory with atoms, uh, which are sometimes called Ur elements. So if you're not a set theorist and you use sets in your mathematics, you're typically talking about sets of objects. Right? You're talking about sets of numbers, sets of integers, sets of real numbers, uh, maybe sets of functions, maybe sets of points, but it's always going to be sets of things, or maybe sets of sets of concrete things, or sets of sets of sets of concrete things, or functions of concrete things. Um, ultimately, your uses of sets are going to be founded upon things that aren't sets. Now you can represent those things as sets. We have tools for representing points in space as sets. We have tools for representing numbers as sets. We have tools for representing functions as sets. Uh, but fundamentally, those things aren't sets. Based on this idea, when people were originally trying to construct a formal version of set theory, uh, they talked about set theory with atoms. Atoms are things that can be contained in sets, or contained in sets which are contained in sets, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we need to modify the axioms slightly. First of all, atoms are going to be exempt from extensionality. Specifically, uh, atoms, they don't contain anything, or, well, depending on how you, you construct things. But we're going to construct things in such a way that our atoms are, they just don't contain anything. They're not something that we can talk about their elements. And what the extensionality axiom would say in that case is, oh, well, if we look at two atoms, for all things in our set theory, sets or atoms, um, uh, if, uh, if it's contained in one of the atoms, it's also contained in the other atom because nothing is contained in any of the atoms. Uh, so all of our atoms, according to the extensionality axiom, should be equal to each other. Well, that's no good. Uh, and, and they should also be equal to the empty set. Well, that's, that's no good at all. Uh, we want our atoms to be separate, and we want our atoms to be different from the empty set. We want them to be not sets at all. Uh, and so what that means is that we're going to need to make a, a special case within extensionality that says, uh, no, our atoms really are different, even though they contain the same things. Specifically, they contain nothing. On the other hand, atoms are going to be important for extensionality in reverse. If two sets contain different atoms, we're going to want to say that those sets are different. And then optionally, we can also have an axiom that says that there is a set, uh, which I'm going to call uh, A, uh, of atoms. Uh, this is optional. We can have it. We can not have it. Uh, it's sometimes useful to have it, sometimes useful not to. Um, so for now, let's let our set of atoms be, very suggestively, uh, a set, a countable set of pairs. A0, B0, A1, B1, A2, B2, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, based on our names for these things, we know, oh, you know, A0, B0, well, that's our first pair of socks, and we know which one is going to be the left sock and which one's going to be the right sock. Um, but uh, ultimately, we'd like our set theory not to know the difference between those two things. And then just to give it a name, uh, we have our set of pairs with no choice function. I'm just going to call it capital F. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a countable set of pairs put together with the atoms uh, A0, B0, A1, B1, A2, B2, and so on and so forth. And again, the goal is going to be to have this set, but to have no choice function on this set, and that's going to be able to construct a model of set theory that explicitly does not satisfy the axiom of choice. So we're going to be working with a number of different models of set theory, and so I'd like to kind of uh, explain to you how they're all going to be related to each other, uh, and I've put together this diagram to explain that. Uh, but first, I want to think about an analogous situation. Suppose that we're living in the universe of just the real numbers as a ring. Um, we in our universe would believe that you can always divide except by zero. Uh, so we would say that you're closed under division. On the other hand, people who are living in a sub ring of our universe, say the integers, uh, don't think that you can always divide. In fact, they actually have a really interesting study of 
what numbers are divisible by what other numbers. And the reason why people living in this subset universe think that you can't divide is because they're missing some elements that we, in our universe of the real numbers, are aware of, specifically fractions. So we are aware of being able to do divisions uh, within the integers, but people living within the universe of the integers aren't aware of the result of that division. Don't believe that they're closed under division uh, because they're missing those fractions. What makes this a bit more complicated is that we're also going to be wanting to work within a model of set theory. Uh, there's a wide variety of useful construction techniques that are available to us in set theory because of the axioms of set theory. And so we're going to want to be working within a model of set theory to be able to do those constructions. So uh, I'm going to call the universe that we're living in script M, and I'm going to use just the regular containment symbol to indicate actual containment within our universe. And we're going to assume that our universe satisfies the axioms of uh, ZF with our particular choice of atoms uh, and the axiom of choice. Now, because we assume that ZF with our particular choice of atoms and the axiom of choice is a consistent set of axioms, there's actually a theorem, the model existence theorem, that says that we can find a set of elements and a binary relation on that set within our universe, within our model of set theory, that satisfies those axioms, that satisfies those rules for the structure. Uh, and so within our universe, we are going to see a particular set and a particular binary relation encoded as a set uh, that together satisfy the axioms of ZFAC. And we're going to call this structure M prime with its own version of containment, which may or may not agree with our notion of containment, although that's not such a big deal, uh, containment prime. So we should think of M prime as analogous to the real numbers, satisfying the axioms of what it means to be a ring. M prime, with its own notion of containment, is going to satisfy the axioms of ZFA. So we're going to filter out some of the elements of M prime to construct a submodel uh, N with the same notion of containment as M prime. Uh, this is going to satisfy ZFA. Uh, similar to how when we take the reals and we filter down to the integers, that's still going to be a ring. But uh, this submodel n, uh, it's going to hopefully contain our f and not contain a choice function on f. So our goal is when we do this filtering, we don't want to filter out f, and we do want to filter out the choice functions on f. And so what it's going to look like to n is that we're not closed under taking choice functions. Similar to how within the integers, we're not closed under a division because we can't see these particular elements because we've filtered out the fractions from the real numbers. Of course, once you start thinking about uh, uh, models of set theory within models of set theory, you start asking a wide variety of existential questions. And this is a fairly common thing in set theory, that if we have a model and we have a submodel that uh, has the same notion of containment, it's just we filtered out some of the elements, that because we've filtered out elements, the submodel is going to think about the universe differently than the way that the model does. It's going to think that different things are true. And that's our goal, right? Our goal is that M prime is going to think that the axiom of choice is true and that therefore our set F is going to have a choice function. On the other hand, we're going to want our submodel N, even though it has the same notion of containment, we're going to want N to not contain these choice functions and so not think that the axiom of choice is true because even though n has f in it, um, it's not going to have any choice functions on f. And this sort of thing happens in lots of other ways as well in set theory.
For instance, what a model thinks is countable and what a submodel thinks is countable might be very different, again, even though they have the same notion of containment. Recall what it means to be countably infinite. A set is countably infinite if it's bijective with omega. So a model might be aware of a bijection between omega and this particular set, and a submodel might still have this particular set, but not have that bijection in it. The bijection got filtered out. And what this means is that the submodel thinks that this set is not bijective with omega, even though the larger model does think that this set is bijective with omega. And so they're, go they're going to disagree on what sets they think are countably infinite. In fact, submodels might have a different notion of omega. Recall that omega is the smallest set that contains the empty set and is closed under this set theoretic plus one operation. Emphasis on the smallest set part. It may be the case that a larger model is aware of an even smaller set that contains the empty set and is closed under the plus one operation. But this smaller set gets filtered out. This smaller set is what the larger model thinks is omega, but it gets filtered out. And so the next smallest uh, set that contains the empty set and is closed under adding one um, becomes the new omega in this smaller model. Submodels might have a different notion of power set, not because they have a different notion of subset that's based on their notion of containment, but because various subsets might be missing from this smaller model. And in fact, lots of subsets might be missing from this smaller model uh, in a way that, that makes the power set of a set completely different uh, in terms of its properties when we look at these submodels. So I just want to recall the context that we're setting up here. We have a structure, uh, M prime, and it's going to have its own notion of containment, and it's going to form a model of ZFA plus choice uh, with our particular choice of atoms, right? the countable set of pairs. And we're going to try to find a substructure right, to filter out some of the elements of M prime uh, so that the substructure is also a model of ZFA, also contains F, and does not have any of the choice functions on F. So our goal is to filter out the choice functions on F without filtering out F. So I'm actually going to want to build up to the construction that we're going to do to filter out M prime to construct N in order to motivate uh, the steps and, and the construction that we're going to do. So first of all, we're going to want our model to contain our atoms and be closed under basic set theoretic constructions, right? So uh, I'm talking about nested finite set construction, right? If we have a bunch of elements, some finite collection of elements, we can use pairing and union together to just put them together into a, a finite set. And then we can take those finite sets and use them as part of larger sets and so on and so forth. Uh, so we need to be closed under these basic set theoretic uh, uh, constructions that we'll do, uh, such as uh, the set that we can see below, right? This is simply, we take sets that we already know exist and we put them together using just basic tupling. But of course, these are finite tupling operations. If we want to construct infinite sets, we're going to need to use other tools to put them together. So one of the things that we could say is, oh, well, we need to, be, we need to have these sets and we need to be able to put them together so that we're only putting together finitely many of them at the same time, and we need our atoms. So what we're going to do is we're going to, when we filter down M prime, we're going to keep in N any set such that the set of atoms that are contained at any depth, so not just immediately contained, but also contained in elements of, or contained in elements of elements of a particular set, such that the set of atoms that are contained at any depth in that set is finite. So here we have an example of a set uh, using you know, this basic uh, tupling uh, construction that we're trying to do. And we see that the atoms that this set refers to are A0, B0, A1, B3, B4, 
the things that were actually used to construct this set. And so there's a finite set of atoms uh, that are contained in the set uh, at, at any depth. And so we want to include this set uh, when we do our filtering. We want to keep this set in n, but then any set that contains infinitely many atoms is no good. And what that's going to do is it's going to take our choice functions on f and get rid of them because the choice functions on f are going to have infinitely many uh, atoms in them. So it's clear immediately that this isn't the thing that we want. It's going to get rid of f. But let's actually take a look at the axioms of zf to see if this thing is a model of set theory at all. So extensionality, we actually inherit. Uh, n uh, inherits uh, extensionality from m prime. There's a subtlety, and I'll talk about that subtlety in a couple of slides. Um, but it's simply, if it's true in m prime, then extensionality is going to be true in n. Similar for foundation. We don't need to worry about that when we're going to submodels. And then we just need to check all of these closure operations. Uh, for instance, if we have two sets um, that uh, rely on uh, finitely many atoms, is the pair of those two uh, going to also rely on finitely many atoms? Sure, it's going to rely on the union of uh, those two sets of atoms, and that's going to be finite. So we're going to be closed under pairing. And similar arguments can be used to show that the other closure at axioms are satisfied as well, including the existence of omega. Uh, omega doesn't depend on any atom, so we don't need to worry about omega. Uh, but, so this actually is, doing this particular filtering actually does give us a model of ZF set theory. The problem is we've tossed out too much stuff. Uh, specifically, we've tossed out F, and we've also tossed out A, because they are infinite sets of atoms. And this particular construction has tossed out all of our infinite sets of atoms. Um, so this is a little bit too much. But it's interesting to note that this construction did give us a model of ZFA. Let's take a look for a moment at the set F that we would like to keep in our model. Here we have infinitely many AIs and infinitely many BIs, but they're occurring in parallel with each other. They occur within the same set. So what we would like to say is if an AI occurs in the same set as a BI, that's fine. We don't need to, we don't need to count that against our allocation of finitely many uh, AIs and BIs within the set. And that way we'll be able to have these infinitely many uh, AIs and BIs paired together the way that we have in our original set F. Something a little bit subtle happens here where we need to allow AI and BI to occur in different sets but symmetrically from each other. Uh, for instance, we can apply, there's a first order logic definable function that takes a set and takes all of the elements of elements of sets. So this is going to take F and it's going to take the individual atoms and replaces them with the singleton of that set or object. Uh, in which case it's going to take all of the atoms in our construction of F and replace them with the singleton of that atom. So here I have uh, what that set winds up looking like below. Uh, you just replace, you know, A0 with the set of A0 and B0 with the set of B0 in our construction of F and so on and so forth. And by the axiom of replacement, if we're going to have F, we need to have this other set here, where the AIs and BIs occur in different sets, but they're symmetrically related to each other still. So that needs to be okay, and that needs to be able to happen infinitely often, uh, because that's happening infinitely often in this set that we need to have if we're going to have F and the axiom of replacement. Um, but what we want to say is that if you have an AI that's just all by itself and it's not paired symmetrically with a BI, uh, then uh, that's less okay. We still need to allow it. Remember that we still need to allow you know, these finite constructions that have the singleton of any one particular atom or we can join a bunch of those together. Uh, we still need those, but 
we're going to say that you can only do this finitely often, specifically for finitely many indices i, are you allowed to have an ai that's not paired with a bi or a bi that's not paired with an ai. And this is going to prevent the choice functions on f because within these choice functions, when the choice function specifies uh, what is going to be our choice on the first pair, what is going to be our choice on the second pair, what is going to be our choice on the third pair, and so on and so forth, this choice um, is either an AI that's unpaired, unsymmetrically related with the corresponding BI, or it's going to be a BI that's unpaired, unsymmetrically related with a corresponding AI. So if we prohibit doing this infinitely often, we're going to prohibit choice functions on f. So let's formalize this idea. Suppose that we have some sort of function, possibly a permutation, on the atoms then we can extend it to all sets. And the way we do this is fairly intuitive. We just uh, identify all occurrences within that set of an atom, and we apply the function to that atom. So for instance, if we're looking at a particular function that just swaps A1 and B1, it leaves everything else the same, it just swaps that particular pair, um, then we, if we try to apply this to a particular set, we just want to identify instances of A1 or B1 and swap them with each other. And so this is what happens if we apply that function to that entire set. And we're just going to want to focus on permutations that either swap or don't swap each pair. So the permutation is going to have a set of pairs that it's going to swap, uh, and that's it. It's not going to do anything else. It's not going to uh, you know, move uh, these atoms between pairs. It's just going to swap or not swap each of the pairs. So our attempt two at constructing this model of uh, ZFA uh, n is to take m prime and filter out. We're going to want to only keep the sets that are closed under all swapping permutations. So we actually still have the kind of closure that we're looking for, but something goes horribly wrong here. Uh, specifically, we wind up losing the ability to talk about individual atoms or even have those individual atoms in and of themselves, right? We said that we wanted our individual atoms uh, to be part of our, our set theory and you know the singleton of A1 to be part of our set theory and the pair A1, B2 to be part of our set theory. We want to be able to, starting with our atoms, construct a bunch of sets and keep them in our set theory. And those things are not going to be closed under all swapping permutations, but they are going to be closed under some swapping permutations. So hopefully this fixes things. We're going to want to keep in N any set for which there is a finite collection of indices so that any permutation that, that swaps uh, uh, or doesn't swap pairs um, that fixes those indices, so doesn't swap the pairs corresponding to that finite set of indices, fixes the set. In this case, we say that the set has finite support. That is, we're going to treat i as the support of the set. Those, so i is going to specifically refer to those pairs of atoms where we can have those atoms unmatched, right? So if we have a set and it just contains A1 and B2, then its support is going to be the set 1 comma 2 because it contains A1 unpaired and B2 unpaired. But if we had the set containing A0, B0, and B3, its support, it wouldn't need uh, zero to be in its support because it's perfectly fine to apply a swapping operation to the zeroth pair uh, and that's going to leave the set alone. The only thing we need to do is avoid swapping B3 for A3 because that is going to change the set. So the support of that set is going to be uh, just the set containing three. So let's check, is this thing going to satisfy our axioms? Um, well, it's going to satisfy our closure axioms. It's a little bit trickier to show that it satisfies the closure axioms, but that's perfectly fine. 
it, infinity is going to exist. Again, we're going to inherit foundation, but actually extensionality is going to break in a really gross way. So when we're constructing a submodel by filtering out elements, we need to be really careful. If we filter out any of the elements of a set, we're going to want to filter out that set as well. Suppose that our larger model contains two sets, one of which has an element B in it, and one of which doesn't have the element B, but otherwise they're identical. Now suppose that when we're filtering down, we remove the element B, but we don't remove these two sets. Well, they were different sets in M prime, but now when we do this filtering process, we're kind of going to want to say that they're the same set. Extensionality wants them to be the same set, but then we're going to have to like quotient out by this equivalence relation, and that's going to make everything harder to prove, so we, we don't want to do that. We want the notion of what it means to be equal in our larger structure to be the same as what it means to be equal in the smaller structure. So let's take a look specifically at our construction again. Again, we wanted to keep just those elements with finite support. Um, it turns out that the power set of the atoms uh, needs zero support. Any permutation, whether or not it's just a permutation on the pairs or whether we're just doing an arbitrary permutation on the atoms, any permutation is going to fix the power set of the atoms. It might swap the elements around, but it's not going to change what is and what isn't a subset. On the other hand, there's tons of subsets of the power set of the atoms that we're going to want to filter out. Um, for instance, the set of all AI, we're going to want to filter that out. So what we're going to need to do is make a special exception that if we filter out any of the elements of a set, we're also going to have to filter out that set. The way that we say this is that we're going to keep in N any set with hereditary finite support. So not only does that set have finite support, but all of that set's elements have finite support. And all of the elements of those sets have finite support. And all of the elements of those sets have finite support all the way down. This is what we mean when we say that a set has a property hereditarily. And if you check, finally, this works. We have extensionality um, because we made this specific exception. Uh, we have foundation. We just get foundation for free. And it's a little bit trickier to check, but we are closed under all of these things. So this here is our model. This model is going to contain A, and it's going to contain F, our countable set of pairs, but it's not going to contain any choice function on F, because choice functions on F are not going to have finite support. And what this means is that we have a set that doesn't have a choice function on it. We have a counterexample to the axiom of choice. And that means that all of the properties that are equivalent to the axiom of choice are also not going to be true in this model N. For instance, uh, F, uh, or well, the union of F, uh, A, is not going to have a well ordering on it. Because if we had a well ordering, um, then we'd be able to pick out uh, elements of each of the pair, which, which element, which atom comes first in that well ordering, uh, and then that's going to allow us to make infinitely many choices. It's going to allow us to construct a choice function on this countable set of pairs, which we said doesn't exist. Um, F also serves as a witness that a countable union of countable sets isn't countable. So F is countable. We can, we can uh, count the individual pairs that we have here. And each of the pairs is countable. It's a pair. There's only two elements. It's finitely countable. It's not even infinitely countable. But its union is A. And A has no well ordering. It's not bijective with omega. And so it's not going to be countable. And if we are careful about our construction in such a way as to not favor any one element of a pair over the other, because we're not allowed to do that infinitely often, um, if we toss in that AI is equal to negative BI, and we're also going to have to toss in that BI is equal to negative AI so that we don't favor 
the AIs over the BIs infinitely often, um, we can use this to construct a vector space that doesn't have a basis. Finally, there is a similar, simpler construction that we can do to produce what's called an amorphous set. Suppose that our atoms are just AI for I and omega, uh, and ignore the BIs. And do the same sort of thing, right? We have some sort of model M prime of ZFA uh, with choice uh, with atoms A, with this new set of atoms. Uh, and again, we get that out of the fact that we're assuming, and this is a hefty assumption, that ZFA plus C is consistent. Uh, and then we're going to use a slightly modified uh, filtering process to filter M prime down to the model that we're looking for, M. So we're going to say that a set has finite support. We're going to use that same term to mean something slightly different. If there's a finite collection of indices I, such that if a permutation, and here we're talking about any permutation on the atoms, fixes all of those atoms. So if there's some finite set of atoms that any permutation that fixes those atoms also fixes the full set, right? So we have this finite set of atoms that are allowed to uh, exist independently, and then all of the other atoms have to kind of exist in permutationally uh, symmetric ways. And then we do the same filtering process. We take just those elements of M prime that have hereditary finite support. That is, they have finite support, all of their elements have finite support, all of their elements have finite support, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is going to produce a submodel. And that submodel is going to satisfy ZFA, but it's not going to satisfy choice. In particular, in N, A is actually only going to have finite or cofinite subsets. Because if you had a subset of A, if you had a set of atoms that was both infinite and co-infinite, that is that its complement in A, uh, was infinite, uh, well, then it's not the case that there's a finite collection of indices uh, that, uh, that we can uh, have as our support uh, for that set. So our atoms, our set of atoms, is only going to have finite, well, it, of course it has finite subsets. We can construct finite sets of atoms. Uh, and we can also take the entire set of atoms, and we're closed under set subtraction using the filtering operation, uh, and so we can construct uh, cofinite subsets, but that's it. There are no, there are no infinite co-infinite uh, subsets of the atoms in this particular model. This set is called an amorphous set, and it is extremely strange. Right? You can't well order it. There's no subset of it that is bijective with omega. It's infinite, it, because it's not, it's not finite, um, but there's no subset of it that's bijective with omega, uh, because if there was, you could just look at that bijection and look at the things that got paired up with even numbers and then look at everything else, and both of those sets would be infinite, and so you'd have an infinite co-infinite subset. So this, this set A has lots of weird properties to it uh, in kind of our inability to do stuff with it. It's infinite, but it doesn't, it's, it's hard to get a handle on it the way that we can get a handle on in, infinite sets in a model uh, that, of set theory that has choice. So I like to think of these amorphous sets as weird infinite voids, and this is how you can construct a model of set theory that has one in it. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you learned something and I hope to see you in a future video.